Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Optimizing the Hurdles of Density Gradient Ultracentrifugation for Optimized Gene Therapy Purification Workflows. I'm Kyle Curry of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, and I'll be moderating today's live event. I'd like to thank LabRoots for presenting today's webinar, which is brought to you by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, a global leader in centrifugation and life science instrumentation. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. I encourage you to participate by submitting questions for our speaker at any time. To do so, simply type in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer many questions as we can at the end of this presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or to report a problem, click on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational, so it offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing educating, education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain these credits. With great pleasure, I now present today's speaker, my friend and colleague, Ross Verhuel of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Ross has extensive experience in microfluidic applications paired with production, purification, and characterization of various biomaterials, including viral and non-viral vectors. Ross has extensive experience in optimizing density gradient ultracentrifugation workflows. He's currently a senior application scientist at Beckman with a focus on expanding and developing centrifugation applications. For Ross's complete bio, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Ross, please go ahead and begin your presentation. Thank you, Kyle, for that great introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, today's webinar we're going to cover, as Kyle mentioned, uh, looking at some of the hurdles uh, perceived in density gradient ultracentrifugation, and we'll go through some examples of how these uh, uh, density gradient um, applications apply in gene therapy purification workflows and give an introduction to density gradients as a whole. So uh, we have a few just quick uh, 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 legal uh, slides to go through, and uh, so first, addressing the perceptions about density gradients, um, some of those being shown here on the slide, uh, one being that density gradients are too complex and they're not worth the time invested to learn or implement, uh, another being that the technique is old and it's outdated, no longer relevant, and that density gradients require super long run times and, and don't fit in the process because of the, their duration, and finally, that they're only applicable for small-scale research applications and the focus of this webinar is going to be to address these concerns that some people may have and try to show some examples to dispel uh, these common perceptions. So what we're going to cover uh, in this webinar then is an introduction to density gradients as a whole, uh, what they are, how they're used, and what some of the separation capabilities are. Um, we'll go through examples of how to go through setting up a density gradient experiment and what that process is some of the key considerations, and then we'll have an example of actually putting some of those steps into action. And then finally, we'll, we'll go through a few examples um, about how density gradients are used in biotherapeutic purification, with the examples being for AAVs and plasma DNA. So first to get started, what is density gradient centrifugation? So in the simplest form, um, it's conducted in a column of liquid medium of varying density which subsequently has varying viscosity typically, and the components in the sample are separated based on their physical properties being size, mass, and density, uh, along with some others, including shape, in the presence of centrifugal forces. And the, the means by which the separation actually occurs is that the viscosity of the gradient affects the rate at which the particles move through the, the, this liquid column, and the density affects the final position of the particles. And a quick example that a lot are probably familiar with is PBMC isolation from blood. Uh, this often done with a FICOL gradient, as shown here, where the different components of the blood sample separate based on their density, and from there you can isolate the component of interest. Now, when looking at density gradient ultracentrifugation, it focuses and operates on the exact same principles as normal density gradient centrifugation, with the key differentiator being that the speed and forces exceed 100,000 times the G. So application-wise, and, and how these different uh, techniques are used, is the normal density gradient side is used for larger materials typically because the forces that need to be applied are much lower in order to get proper 
uh, migration rates and separation of these components. So some of the common examples being blood components, mammalian bacterial and other types of cells, um, organelles and subcellular components. But on the ultra side, so with DGUC, uh, it's usually more applicable for smaller materials, so often under a few hundred nanometers. And common applications include exosome and other nanoparticle separations, working with viral vectors and other types of viruses, plasma DNA and many other types of nucleic acids, antibodies and a variety of other proteins, and membrane fractions, including lipoproteins. But on the whole, Density gradient separations um, are used for a wide variety of cells, subcellular components, and different types of therapeutic materials. So looking at now the separation capabilities of density gradients and what they can actually do, I've pulled a few examples, uh, one being shown here, which is looking at viral particles, and in a particular example, separating double-layered versus triple-layered particles that only differ by 0.02 grams per mil. So a small difference in these particles you can separate based on. Another example being um, with different types of nucleic acids. So uh, plasma DNA is, is a common application that I mentioned where you're trying to isolate the supercoiled plasmid versus uh, other DNA and isoforms, and they may differ by 0.04 grams per mil. And you can get even higher resolution um, that's needed for stable isotope probing, an example here being a difference of only 0 0.0036 grams per mil um, between the labeled versus unlabeled nucleic acid strands. So you can get uh, very high resolution separations with this technique, and it's also very repeatable. So there's a study that was done with lipoproteins as another example, where there's only around 2% or less variation within uh, samples of, a, of one rotor and insignificant variation when looking between different rotors. So it's a very repeatable uh, process when you uh, have an optimized system in place. And as far as the basis of these differences go, uh, an example being with viral particles, um, the example before is that you know, they have different uh, layers and that uh, the ratio of the protein to nucleic acid cargo is what drives these differences in the density of the material because proteins have uh, generally a lower density than nucleic acids. So when you're changing that ratio, you change the overall density of the particle and the density gradient separation techniques can um, exploit those differences and, and facilitate that purification. So, um, Overall, the density gradients enable consistent and high purity separations. So in order to relate things back a little bit to other ultracentrification methods, um, I'll, I'll introduce pelleting is something that most people are, are very familiar with. So pelleting um, separates materials based on their size and mass, also known collectively as the uh, S value or sedimentation coefficient is shown at the bottom of the screen, where increasing size and mass increase the, the S value, and the higher the S value, the shorter the time it takes to move the particles from A to B, um, and in the example shown here, to pellet them actually to the bottom of the tube. Um, and the advantage here is that you get a fast and simple separation of materials that have very different S values, but the, the differences come in to when you have more similar materials, and that's why density gradients are often used. So there are three main classes of density gradients types um, being shown here. So rate zonal, equilibrium zonal, and isopycnic. Um, rate zonal is most similar to pelleting in that it, the separation basis is, again, based on the sedimentation coefficient. And the, in this situation, you want a long path length because it's effectively a race where all the materials start at the same point as shown uh, in the picture below. And they move at different rates based on their S values. And the longer the path length is, the longer the, the racetrack, and you get more sediment, uh, more separation as a result of that. Um, so it's useful for materials that have very similar S values, unlike pelleting. With the other two examples, they separate on the basis of density. And in, in that case, um, use a different type of gradient materials, which we'll cover a little bit later. Um, but the advantages there are that with equilibrium zonal, it's prepared typically as a step gradient, um, as shown in the picture, and you can get a one-step purification and concentration of the components by density. So it's pretty simple to prepare these gradients, and you can get pretty good separation. But the real advantage of isopycnic gradients are that these gradients are continuous, 
and you can get the highest possible resolution of separation by density using isopectin gradients. So an example, uh, or a couple examples that we'll go through at the end are, are, again, as we mentioned before, with viral vectors and supercoiled plasmid DNA. Um, so we'll cover those later and touch on them at the end of the presentation. So in order to demonstrate the complementarity of these different types of density gradients, because they separate by different means, um, we'll walk through this slide here, which shows the density of materials, uh, different types of, of biomaterial categories, um, versus their general sedimentation coefficients. And you can use information like this to help dictate and drive what sort of um, density grant type is applicable for the material that you're looking for. So as an example, say you want to look at a particular virus that falls somewhere on the map in, in this general location. The process you might go through is starting with your uh, bioreactor to first harvest your cells. So you might use a high performance centrifuge for that step and assuming that the viral particles of interest are inside the cells, the next step would be to lyse the cells. Again, you can use a high-performance centrifuge to isolate the, the components of the lysate and remove the debris. And then from there, you might choose to do a rate zonal type application. So the green bar here shows the slice that you would obtain from that rate zonal um, centrifuge experiment. And it's not completely pure, you can see that you might get some other virus types in there. There could be some other debris that's um, carried along in the process if you select that slice. And it can help in removing other nucleic acids that are contaminating, which are way on the other side of the screen because they have a much um, different sedimentation coefficient. And then if you follow that up with an isopicnic type density gradient, that can further help remove additional components to really zone in on one specific area of this map. And there's synergies between combining different types of, of the centrifugation techniques. So in terms of being able to get started using density gradients, there's a number of things to consider, especially if you aren't familiar with density gradients as, as a whole in general. And I've simplified it down to, to five basic uh, steps and considerations to go through if you're looking at implementing this in a new process. And those are shown here, and we'll go through those one by one. So the first being looking at your starting material and really taking a, a close look at what it is, what the general composition is, what the concentration is of the material of interest, and the volume to, to find the scale. So other factors that come in here in terms of the decision-making process are, do you need specific types of biocontainment? Do you need to maintain sterility? And do you need to remove any additional um, components of the of the mixture before moving on into the density gradient steps. And these decisions will affect um, the centrifuge type that you need, so the scale and what sort of speed range you're at, whether it's the high performance or the ultra centrifuge that we talked about on the previous slide, um, what type of rotors appropriate, again, for the capacity side, and if there are certain uh, levels of containment that's needed, the scale of the process, so if you need multiple instruments to support the, the overall workflow, what types of tubes um, and sizes make sense, and then sterilization methods, so whether it be for the rotor, uh, the tubes themselves, or if you want to bypass that process and purchase tubes that are already sterilized. The next thing to look at is the separation method. So this is speaking to which type of gradient is most appropriate to isolate the target that you're going after that's desired from the contaminant material. So picking, picking the gradient type. Um, the importance here is looking at how does the target material differ from the contaminant? So looking at the properties of the different types of materials that you're looking at. And then keeping in mind, what's the necessary level of purity that's expected after this step. So if it's early in the process, it maybe isn't a really high level of purity that's needed, but if it's very late stage, the expectation is that the level of purity is much higher. So keeping that in mind and, and picking appropriately for that um, definitely um, is important to, to consider. The effective decisions here are the rotor. Um, so rotors uh, for centrifuges, there are different um, orientations is the main way that they're categorized, and we'll go through that a little bit later in terms of picking the one that's most appropriate for the sample type, as well as the type of density gradient that's been selected. Looking at the tube, um, so the closure type, and we'll go through those a little bit more as well, and then the number of steps in the process. So again, speaking to what level of purity is needed at this particular step in mind of what other 
um, purification steps are to follow downstream. So if you're only doing one centrifuge run or if you plan to do multiple and, and combine it with other sorts of techniques as well. So the third consideration is looking at the density gradient media itself. There are a wide variety of different types of media that are used to elicit these different changes in density. And it's important to consider what is a pro providing the appropriate range. So if you're doing a density-based separation like isopicnic, you need to make sure that the, the gradient material itself is able to support a wide enough range. And then also, if you have functional particles <clears throat> that need to maintain their structure um, or active function, uh, different types of gradient materials might interact differently with the particles, and that also needs to be maintained. The final thing to, to keep in mind really is the downstream workflow, as some of the gradient materials may need to be completely removed before going on to the next step, while others are more acceptable. Um, so just having a line of sight to the next steps to come. Um, is an additional important consideration. And then the effective decisions here are the tube types that you might use and its general chemical compatibility with the material of interest as well as the density gradient media. And then acceptable run compositions, so um, to make sure that it falls within range of, of what the, the tubes and other materials are designed for. So looking a little bit more closely at some of the different types of density gradient media, um, a handful of different categories are shown here um, with polyhydric alcohols, including sucrose and glycerol, uh, a couple common types of density gradient media, uh, as well as phycol that was mentioned before with the PBNC isolation, percol, iodixanol, also known as OptiPrep, is shown here in the iodinated material section, and then inorganic salts like cesium chloride and potassium bromide are common for plasmid separations and lipoprotein separations, respectively. And you can see that different types of materials are more commonly used for certain categories of samples than others, where FICOL, for example, is very common for cells and organelles, large materials, not so common for smaller materials when you get into nanoparticle size and proteins. Um, while other things like idexanol are pretty common across the board and they're able to support a wider variety of workflows and see them uh, on the other end of the spectrum isn't very common for cells and organelles, but it's more common for the smaller type materials. And the last thing to look at here is shown on the left side of this table, which shows self-forming versus layered, where some of these materials um, function by needing to be layered before the gradient at steps, which was previously shown, but others are actually self-forming once a uh, centrifugal force is applied and you can exploit some of those differences to make your workflow a little bit simpler, um, as is the case for cesium chloride usually being uh, treated as a self-forming gradient. So the fourth step in this process is looking at the experiment design itself. So there's an advantage of density gradient ultracentrifugation because it's been around for a long time. This technique is well established, and as a consequence, there is an extensive publication record so more often than not, if you're looking to get started with, with this technique, if you look in the literature, you can often find a protocol that's using a material that's similar to what you might be working with, or you can find something um, that, that maybe is close enough to, to serve as a starting point. And if you don't find something that's an exact match, you can always consider the properties of the target of interest versus the contaminants, where if you know the sedimentation coefficient, um, you can use that to build out some of these, um, some of these experiments as well. Um, but it's a lot easier just to start with a quick literature search to, to get the ball rolling. And the effective decisions here are finalizing the, the needs for the centrifuge itself, the rotor, the gradient specifications, and then the run parameters, so the time, the speed, and the temperature. So when it comes to picking a rotor, um, the, the three main considerations to keep in mind are the speed, the capacity, and the type. So the speed in terms of g-force that's being applied, capacity can be the, both the overall volume of the rotor as well as the number of tubes that it might accommodate. And the type is uh, really coming down to the orientation or the path length of the, of, that the sample has to travel. So the three main categories are shown here at the bottom of the slide. 
being vertical, fixed angle, and swing the bucket. Vertical rotors, the tube is upright in position, so it has a short pass length. So for an isopicnic type run where you want a short pass length in order to establish a self-forming gradient, it, they're often used in vertical rotors, and you can reap some of those benefits due to that short pass length. Whereas fixed angle, which is also commonly used for pelleting, you can also do density gradients in these. Um, but if you have a material that's in the sample that might be likely to pellet out, you don't have to worry about that in the fixed angle situation. You're also able to reach high speeds and have relatively high capacities. So some of the common applications there are using exosomes and viral vectors. And swinging bucket is most commonly used for rate zonal type applications because the tube orientation changes during centrifugation where it swings into an outward position and you get the longest path length in this situation. So doing separations of antibodies and, and antibody conjugates and exosomes are most common for this because you're doing a separation based on size and not so often density. And the general rule of thumb with, with centrifugation when it comes to rotor selection is that if you increase the speed, you decrease the time, again, relating to the sedimentation coefficient of the particles. And if you decrease the pass length, you also decrease the time. So those factors all come in when you're looking at which rotor is most appropriate. And then when it comes to tube selection, there's actually quite a variety of tubes that are available. Um, the main considerations here are the tube material. So largely in terms of chemical compatibility, again, with the gradient media and the sample composition itself, the capacity or the volume of the tubes and the sample containment recovery method. So this comes down to the type of closure. And examples are shown down here um, below. The blue labels are for the different tube materials. So the most common ones being polycarbonate, ultra clear, and polypropylene with polypropylene generally having the most chemical resistance, so it's a, a pretty common selection. Um, but UltraClear provides a little bit more clarity, so if you really need to see uh, a small quantity of sample in there, it can be beneficial for that as well. And then looking at the closure types, you can have a screw cap, which is more like a bottle design. On the other right. end is an open top tube, which allows for easy sample recovery. And then OptiSeal and QuickSeal tubes are available that can help maintain sterility in a workflow because the tube itself is actually completely sealed um, in the process. And then finally, uh, sterile tubes are also available um, to an extent and can help expedite a workflow and, and make it a little bit easier to get started with a process. So the next part of this is actually looking at how you're actually going to assemble the, these gradients uh, once you know what you want to do based on a literature sure literature search or whatever method you use to identify the, the experiment you'd like to conduct. So a few are shown here. And the step gradient creation usually is done by a few different methods. Um, there are two general manual methods that you can use being overlay or underlay as shown here. With the overlay approach, you will put the most dense material in first and then subsequently add the lighter uh, or less dense layers on top of that to build up your gradient stepwise. With the underlay methods, it's basically the exact opposite where you actually start with the least dense material first, and you can use a long needle or, or cannula to then subsequently layer in the increasingly dense materials below it. And in the end, you get the same result, um, which is somewhat, it's a matter of preference, um, underlayering is also generally more amenable to using tubes that have a narrower opening. So like the quick seal tubes and opti seal tubes, it's often a little bit easier. And then on the other hand, you can do automated approaches um, with automated, automated liquid handlers, such as the biomech that's shown here, where you can program in uh, the desired gradient and, and get it built out for you um, in a little bit more of a hands-free method that has some additional benefits to that. And then for the needs that uh, require continuous or linear gradients, there are a few different ways to go at, at making these, with the first being passive diffusion. So in this case, you actually start with a step gradient that you prepare with the one of the methods above. And just using diffusion, either at room temperature or refrigeration, um, the different layers will diffuse over time. And once you have a process that's optimized, 
you can know uh, that you'll be getting a continuous layer on the back end of this. Um, using a similar process or facilitated diffusion that I've called here, uh, again, you can start with the step gradient, but if you take the tube and cap it and put it on its side, you increase the surface area between the different layers of the gradients, and that increased surface area expedites the diffusion process. So you can basically um, get a continuous gradient in a little bit shorter time. And then the third option is using uh, some sort of a mixing system. A two-chamber mixer is showed here where you can actually have a high-density material flow into a lower-density material that's constantly being mixed. So the output density of the material is constantly changing. So this um, depiction is sort of a combination of the underlay method with a mixing system on the, on the front end. And then finally, um, after the, the run's been decided, and then you need to get your sample out. And there are a few different methods that, that can be used for the sample recovery on the back end of centrifugation. And the simplest one is shown here first, which is just by petting. So especially if you have an open top tube or a screw cap type design and the sample's near the top, then pipetting is very amenable to, to this sort of approach. Um, the next option, uh, which is common, is syringe extraction. So there's a, a cartoon depiction as well as a picture of what it actually looks like here, um, where if you have a sealed tube, especially with the picture shown being for a quick sealed tube, um, you need to, because of the small opening at the top, you need to be able to access the material often in a different way. So the tubes are puncturable from the side. So you can go in there with precision and be able to isolate just the band of interest or the material of interest and not get as much contamination um, of, the, of the impurities that, that might be nearby. And then finally, uh, you can drain the tube effectively. So instead of doing a syringe extraction with a needle from the side, in this case, you can pierce the bottom of the tube with a, a needle. There are also uh, methods that you can use to actually drain from the top. Um, but this is particularly useful if you don't know where your sample of interest is or it's not something that's visible because you can drain the whole tube, you can collect separate fractions as shown here, and then you can collect information um, in terms of guiding you towards identifying which fractions you want to keep, which ones you want to discard because they have impurities or low concentration or whatever the reason may be. Um, so picking the recovery method, there are a few different options. Um, but depending on the two types that you've selected and where the, the sample resides and the degree of separation, that can help drive uh, towards making a selection here. And then finally, uh, putting these five steps into action. Um, in this case, it's an example with a classical AAV type of purification using density gradients. So the first step, you might choose to pre-concentrate the cell lysate first and digest some of the interfering components. And the reason for this is that if you have a lower volume of sample going into the denser gradient run, um, it can increase the efficiency of the whole process. And then digesting the DNA that might be in the solution reduces viscosity. And as we touched on before, viscosity affects the migration rate. So if you have a lower sample viscosity, the particles will move faster through the solution and you can actually have a shorter run. For the second step, you might choose to do an equilibrium zonal in a fixed angle rotor using sterile polypropylene quick seal tubes. And the reasons for this is because then you can maintain sterility with the, with the pre-sterile tubes. And the output of the step is that you can isolate the full AAVs from some of the other contaminants and proteins. And then the third step, the type of gradient that you might select for this then is iodexanol, which is a very common one in this process. It allows you to easily transition into other analysis techniques such as AUC or to go into further purification if you want to add on a cesium chloride gradient to really refine that isolation of the full particles only and get rid of more of the, the empty and partially full particles. And iDixonol is often selected it, um, for this application because it does provide the opportunity for osmotic balance, which helps to maintain the AAV functionality and without compromising their integrity. And it doesn't uh, typically in interfere with many of the downstream steps you might um, often use. And then step four, loading the sample um, is commonly done at a 1 to 1.5 ratio of the gradient um, with a, in an Optimex band ultra centrifuge. Uh, 
And the Type 70 rotor is a fixed angle rotor. That's very common for this. And the speeds are typically at over 500,000 RCF or G uh, for 80 minutes. And the output here is that you can concentrate the full AAV particles separately from the empties and the partials using a method like this. And then finally, on the back end in step five, doing syringe extraction of the visible full AAV band and proceeding with the downstream workflow. So again, as mentioned before, syringe extraction allows you to be able to extract uh, the vis visible component of interest directly from the tube and minimize the contaminant carryover. So going into the first example that we have, um, looking at optimizing large-scale AAV purification with density gradient ultracentrifugation. The challenge here is something that many people in the field are probably familiar with, but it's to isolate the functional AAV capsids that have the full genome and specifically removing the empty and partially full particles from the sample. And the reason why to use density gradient ultracentrifugation in this case is because full and non-full AAVs are separated on the basis of their density, which we went over before. And it's due to the differences in the protein to nucleic acid ratios. So because a truncated genome inside the particle means less total nucleic acid in the particle, it thus has a lower density, and that's the, the basis that the, the separation can take advantage of. So the common methods here, uh, one example is shown on the previous slide, um, which is using simple iodexanol step gradients in an equilibrium zonal type um, of experiment. Other methods also include chromatography, including ion exchange, but there are usually numerous steps required in the series to uh, achieve the same level of purity, and it can often be a very difficult process um, despite going through numerous iterations. And so, the one uh, opportunity with density gradient centrifugation as a whole um, that, that I always encourage is looking at opportunities for improvement. Um, because it's a, a long-standing technique, there's a lot of information out there. And if you're following a process that's not specific to what you're looking at, there might be room for improvement um, given your own specific sample type. So uh, one thing I'd like to reference here is the opportunities for this particular field in terms of AAV purification with density gradients. The example on the previous slide is kind of the classical approach, but there's a, a publication that, that's been out for a while that shows the opportunity to improve on these methods by more than seven and a half fold with just simple process optimization. So including both optimizing the density gradient design itself as well as the run parameters in terms of the speed and, and, and time that's been done. And they showed that there's no difference in the efficacy of the particles or the productivity. So what they demonstrated here is that you could get purification from an equivalent of about 10 liters of starting cell culture in a single 20-minute density gradient run using the Type 70 rotor. And the overall process then becomes, if you scale that up over time, um, throughout an eight-hour shift, so a single working day, that process that they came up with is able to process 128 liters of cell culture using a single instrument. So you can imagine that if you can support a couple of instruments in parallel, you can easily scale out this process to be able to support um, increasingly large scales of, of cell culture and viral vector production in general. So the second example that we'll cover is with plasma DNA. Um, the challenge here is to isolate the complete supercoiled plasma DNA from other nucleic acids and proteins. And as many people know, the plasma DNA is a starting material for a lot of different biotherapeutics, whether it be antibodies, uh, proteins and enzymes, or, or viral vectors. Um, but getting a really quality starting material is important to make sure that the downstream process is as productive and effective as possible. And so the reason why to use density gradients in this case is it's well established. Um, the cesium chloride method has been around for decades, and many people often find better transfection efficiency using this method. So the classical approach is using uh, cesium chloride, as mentioned before, as the density gradient material uh, mixed with acidium bromide 
to help further uh, exacerbate the differences in density and do the separation based on that. And there's a, a picture shown here of what that sort of separation looks like. Um, and some of the other methods, again, include chromatography. But as before with the AAV example, there are often numerous sequential steps required to reach high levels of purity. And, and as before, again, it's, it can be difficult to reach the, the same level of purity as, as many researchers find. So again, there are opportunities to improve um, even upon this, this long-standing method. Um, some of the alternatives include different types of the protocols with different materials. So um, it's been demonstrated that you can replace the cesium chloride and acidium bromide materials with idexanol and DAPI. Um, so there is work being done in terms of providing uh, maybe some more um, appropriate materials that you can use to facilitate this sort of separation. And then another opportunity is in terms of uh, changing the process a little bit, where I mentioned before that cesium chloride is a uh, self-forming type of gradient material. So the common way that these experiments are done is making a homogeneous solution of cesium chloride at a certain density, and upon centrifugation, it will self-form based on the speed that the centrifuge is running at. But uh, this process requires the gradient to self-form, and that takes time. And that's the main reason why this is a longer process um, than, than it necessarily needs to be. And the run times historically are often 16 hours or more. But it's been shown that if you, instead of starting with a single homogeneous gradient, if you actually pre-layer it as a step gradient, the time it takes to create uh, the equilibrium gradient at the end and, and reach that status is significantly reduced. And you can take a, a day-long method down to only a few hours um, so by putting a little bit more effort on the front end, you can significantly reduce, um, a, again, a, a very long-standing method and make it a lot more applicable for implementation into a workflow. So the final point that we'll, we'll talk about is, again, in line with the history of density gradients, um, where it's both historic, um, so it's been around for, for many, many years, um, is largely pioneered by Bracky and, and some others in the early 1950s, and it really took off in popularity with the classic Messelson stall experiment in 1957, looking at the replication of DNA. Um, so it's been around for a long time. Um, there had been work done before that, but it, I would argue that it's still a modern technique as there are still many leading CROs and CMOs globally offering these services with density gradient ultracentrifugation implemented into CGMP workflows. So it's still being done um, at, at larger scales and in commercially available. Um, and the publication record uh, using DGUC still continues to grow. So a number I pulled last week um, showed that there were 1,700 publications, um, according to Google Scholar, from 2018 to where we are right now in 2019. So this technique still has a lot of traction and it's still being widely used. And then finally, in summary, um, density gradient ultracentrifugation is a high-resolution purification technique for critical biotherapeutics and other materials. And it's often chosen for its ability to provide high-quality products in CGMP environments. And so again, addressing the uh, few perceptions that I had mentioned before about density gradients being too complex, outdated, really long run times, and only suitable for small scale. Um, I think a more modern viewpoint is that you can simplify the process down to a few steps. Um, it's still being widely used right now in very modern and emerging workflows like AAV purification. And that with some optimization, you can significantly improve upon the process and really reduce run times to increase um, both scale and throughput. And uh, I've got included here a few of the reference that I, I mentioned throughout the discussion. And then finally, I'd like to thank you for your time and, and for attending today. Um, we, if you have interest in learning more from Beckman Coulter, you can, of course, visit our website for lots of content there. Um, there's a spin site section that's new to our website now, which gives some information on some of the basic techniques and general concepts about centrifugation in general and how we fit into various types of workflows. We have some AUC webinars as well, so analytical ultracentrifugation, if you'd be interested in learning about um, not just the preparative side of ultra centrifugation or centrifugation in general, but how we can actually play a role in analytical and characterizations. 
And then there's a detailed density gradient guide that's very much in line with today's webinar, but provides a lot more detailed information on examples as well as how to set up the process, um, different opportunities, and lots of more uh, literature citations, and that's coming out soon. And then finally, we'll be at the Biophysical Society meeting coming up in February of 2020. Um, a colleague and, and I will be attending and holding a workshop on both preparative and analytical ultracentrifugation. So if you're going to be at the meeting or if you'd like to get more information, you can meet with us there at that time. So with that, again, thank you for your attention, and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Ross, for a great presentation on overcoming the hurdles of density gradient ultracentrifugation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. As a reminder, submit questions by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the left side of your screen. All right, with that, we'll get started with our first question. Uh, why would I choose to use density gradients for plasmid prep when I could just use a kit instead? So that's a good question, Kyle. Um, so kits can be useful for screening very small quantities of plasmids, especially in getting started. But the general trend that I mentioned before is that density gradients often produce the highest quality plasmids, and even slight improvements can be impactful on critical applications like viral vector production, where productivity is already lower than desirable, and there's a lot of room for improvement there, and, and it's a focal point in, in that field. Um, so using density gradients for plasmid prep might uh, help to further boost the product outputs. All right, thanks, Ross. Uh, the second question, how can exosome isolation be scaled up for larger production volumes? So this is a really good question as well, um, and, and something that we hear about a lot as, as exosomes continue to gain more interest. Um, for large-scale isolation of, of something like exosomes, I definitely look at uh, recommend looking at either large scale tube rotors like the Type 45, but also the continuous flow ultra centrifuge offerings that there are. Um, we didn't cover continuous flow rotors in this webinar, though the general principles are the same. And for example, the CF32 rotor can reach just over 100,000 G, which is in the common space for exosome isolation. Um, and continuous flow rotors, however, uh, sample can be continuous pumped into the spinning rotor, and that allows for the larger materials to be able to get pushed into the density gradient. And because exosomes from culture media are typically in quite low concentrations, there is potential to process large volumes of the clarified culture media in a single process. All right, next question. Uh, why would a density gradient give a better purification than ion exchange chromatography for AAVs? So the major shortcoming of ion exchange chromatography is that while the full and empty particles have a fairly substantial surface charge difference, the difference of full and partially full capsids can be very small. And resolving these minute differences can be very challenging and often requires lots of protocol optimization upon making any changes to the system, whether it be the gene of interest or the capsid shell, which will um, have an effect on the surface charges. With density gradients, on the other hand, the system reaches a stable equilibrium, as is the case for isopycnic gradients that we covered. And because of this equilibrium, it's possible to extract the density range of interest. And further, there's little or no optimization generally needed when making changes to the AAV design, as the density gradient process is serotype independent. All right, a follow-up question to that. What's the harm in having some partially full AAVs present in my final formulation? Can't they act as sacrificial decoy in the body? So this is a good question that comes up sometimes as well. Um, and while some research has shown that the presence of non-functional AAVs can act as sacrificial decoys, allowing the full particles in the mix a better chance of reaching the target, this clearance phenomenon is still a random process, and the non-functional particles aren't specifically selected for more than the full particles. So in order to increase the therapeutic response, you could add either more functional or non-functional particles. However, because non-functional particles obviously cannot elicit the desired therapeutic effect, they will only raise the immunogenic potential. So I would strongly recommend working with, as a controlled 
and purely full particles as possible to ensure maximal therapeutic activity at the lowest dose. All right, All right. A, a few, few more, more questions. questions. Um, how do you calculate such low densities so accurately? So I, I, I'll try to read in this question as best I can. Um, if it's calculating the density of what's actually coming out, uh, so of the material, uh, the density gradient material itself, um, refractometers are commonly used for this, uh, whether they're used inline or, or standalone. Um, but yeah, typically it's a, a refractometer that's used. You can also use an analytical balance. Um, if the question is more directed at calculating the density of the sample material itself, there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, you can use analytical ultracentrifugation, um, but one thing to keep in mind is that the density of a material in one type of density media will not necessarily match in something else. And so the, the example being that if you um, had uh, viral particles, for example, in sucrose or iodixanol, they wouldn't necessarily go to the exact same total solution media, but it's, a, it's because it balances both the viscous forces as well in that, along with the density itself. All right, a few more uh, have come in. Um, are there other alternatives to ethidium bromide for cesium chloride density gradient? So, so yes, there are alternatives. Um, I, I mentioned one example um, in one of the later slides, um, and these will be available on demand later that you can review. Um, it's been demonstrated with idexanol as the replacement for cesium chloride, and then DAPI instead of ethidium bromide. There's other work that's been done with some other um, type of binding agents. Um, I know I've seen gel green used for um, some other types of nucleic acid, but there, yeah, there are some examples out there that have been developed already, and I think there are definitely opportunities for others that can be utilized as well. All right, a couple more questions. So can you use this technique to separate drug-loaded vesicles from empty vesicles, and what kind of gradient material would you suggest? So that's an interesting question. Um, so the, the short answer is yes, there's definitely potential to help with that. Um, the reason being that the drug-loaded vesicles would um, likely have a different density or sedimentation coefficient that you could exploit. Um, so depending on which of those um, differences there is, uh, that would drive you towards picking the right type of, of density gradient. So for example, if the if the drug is higher in density than the rest of the particle itself, um, then you probably could use a isopicnic type gradient or equilibrium zonal if it's a big difference. Um, and then choosing the appropriate uh, media type to go with that depends on the, the composition of the, the drug loaded particle itself. But um, whether it be idexanol, cesium chloride, or, or something similar to that would, would be useful. All right, it looks like we have one more question, Ross. Um, if we have dimerized AAV capsids in our loading sample, will they be localized in the same fraction as monomeric capsids, or will they be in more dense fraction after centrifugation is done? So this is a really good question. Um, so it'll depend on how the dimerization is occurring. Um, if there's if the individual particle density is still maintained um, and there aren't any conformational changes or anything that would affect the, the density of the particles, then you would expect them to, to co-localize both the, the monomer and the dimer. Um, but if there are any changes that are taking place, um, they, they, would, um, they would be possible to separate. Um, if this is the, the kind of thing that you're trying to separate though, monomer versus dimer, um, the best approach would be to do a rate zonal run, in which case you're looking at the, more the size and the mass of the particle, so the sedimentation coefficient, and you'd be able to do that sort of separation a lot better um, with rate zonal versus an, uh, a density-based separation like isopictin. Thank you, Ross. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, I, I think the, the final comments I have is, is just that the density gradient ultracentrifugation technique is really versatile um, and can provide a lot of benefits over some of the, the other types of methodologies being chromatography um, in some key application areas. 
some of those applications being AAVs and, and plasmid purification, like I mentioned before. Um, again, because the, the modality of separation using this technique is, is largely uh, or can be density-based, which not very many other techniques can, can really look at doing separations in that sort of a, a method. Um, so I think being more open-minded to, to implementing the density gradient techniques can uh, be really beneficial um, as an alternative or an adjacent um, purification opportunity. All right, Ross, thank you again for taking the time to discuss density gradient creation. I'd like to also thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Before we go, I'd like to finally thank our audience for joining us today and participating. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information provided in the time of registration. When the webinar recording is available for replay, you will receive an email from LabRoots. And I encourage you to share this recording with your colleagues who may have missed the event today. Hope to see you again at our upcoming webinars. Until then, take care. <laughs>